Good morning, church. Greetings from Union Avenue and Maryland on my parents' couch. If you're catching our worship service live stream on Facebook, please like, share, comment during this time together. However you got here, we are joined together in the spirit of the living God to praise, to receive a good word, to celebrate the love of the risen Christ at his table. Today is a special holy day in the church year called the Feast of Holy Trinity. And Christians all around the world are thinking about God's nature and what that means for us as people of faith. We're all connected as Christians to the Spirit of God and around the Lord's table, be it in physical space or as of right now in cyberspace. We'll be sharing in Holy Communion this morning to take, so go ahead and gather some communion elements that you may have around your house be it bread, wine, juice, coffee, tea, <laughs> anything you'd like. They don't have to be bread and wine necessarily, but simply those things that help discern our common life in God. And if you prefer to just watch and meditate, that's fine too. Know that you are a beloved child of God and always have a place at Christ's table among friends. And so friends, let us worship God together this day. So hear these words from the World Council of Churches. In mystery and grandeur, we see the face of God in earthiness and the ordinary. We love, we know the love of Christ in heights and depths and life and death. The Spirit of God is moving among us. Let us praise. Amen. Come now, Almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. One Spirit of holiness, on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, thou rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, Spirit of power. To the great one in three, eternal praises be, and sabbatmore, thy sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and love. Good morning, church. I'm glad you're with me today. In a few minutes, we're gonna hear more about today being Trinity Sunday, when we think about how we can experience God in three different ways. But what I'd like to spend a few minutes on to share with my younger friends has to do with a Bible verse that talks about three important things that's talked about in the Old Testament in the book of Micah. In the Old Testament, we learn a lot from the prophets, and Micah was one of them. Prophets are wise people who love God deeply and who help others understand how God wants us to act. Back in Micah's time, there were a lot of people that were making a lot of bad choices, and they looked to Micah for some help. They asked Micah, what does God require of us? How does God want us to act? What does he want us to do? 
So Micah tried to make it simple for them. He told them God requires three things. The first thing Micah told them had to do with doing justice. He said God requires us to do justice or act justly. Do you know what that means? Lately, I bet you're hearing a lot about justice and about protests in our community and around our nation by people who want justice for a man named George Floyd who died tragically. Justice means fairness. God wants us to treat others fairly and to use the same rules for everyone. In today's world, we need to work harder and we need to do a lot better at treating each other fairly, especially when it comes to treating people fairly whose skin is different than our own. We have to be fair because we're all of God's children. The second thing that Micah told people to do is that he said that God required us to love kindness. We have to love others like God loves us. And the third thing that God requires, Micah says, is to walk humbly with God. What Micah was trying to teach is that we need to stay close to God. We need to remember that God is with us and walk humbly with Him to reflect God's love and God's light on others because we're created in His image. So this week, as we try to understand all the pain and all the anger and all the sadness that is connected with the death of George Floyd and so many others who don't have justice in their lives. We need to remember the three things that God requires of us. Remember to do justice, act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God so we can reflect God's love and His light on others. Justice is possible, but we have to work harder and we have to work together with God by our side to make that happen. Have a good week, everyone. Stay safe, be kind, love others, and walk humbly. Take care. Good morning, church, and greetings to you all on this Feast of the Holy Trinity. Last week, I shared with you the words of African-American author, activist, and feminist, Adrienne Marie Brown. Things are not getting worse. They are getting uncovered. We must hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil. These words couldn't be more true following the murder of George Floyd and the national unrest and outrage over the systemic oppression against people of color in this country. As we seek to proclaim the truth of how things really are, where is God? Where in our faith tradition can we find God in the midst of the struggle for racial justice? Trinity Sunday is a once-a-year feast day on which we contemplate the nature of God. Often we hear language such as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we also know God to be Mother, Wisdom, Womb of Life, or Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier, or Author, Word, Advocate. There are certainly more than three ways we contemplate God's nature, it just seems that humans have a tendency to group things in threes. And so today, I want us to explore three images of God found in the Bible that speak to our stricken times today. One of the earliest stories in the book of Genesis is that of Cain murdering his brother Abel, the first act in sacred scripture labeled as a sin. After the terrible deed, the Lord said to Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. 
For too long this nation has been deaf to the cries of Abel, deaf to the outrage of God who is the ground of all being, covered with the blood of those made in God's own image. There have not been enough ears for hearing, and what eyes there are for seeing cannot see past the varied color of another's skin to recognize such a spectrum reflecting the diversity of God, much less see the spark of divine life within that is so easily extinguished. And lest we forget our own Christian symbolism, the cross that adorns so many of our places of worship reminds us of God's opposition to the death of a brown-skinned innocent man unjustly killed by the state. In fact, on that day when the Son of God was killed, the sky grew dark with God's lament and the ground quaked with God's fury. Where is God in the midst of our racial strife? God is in our righteous indignation and grief-stricken outrage crying up from our depths. Some say that what happened to George Floyd by the police was a case of a few bad apples, and that we shouldn't let that spoil our opinion of the bunch. And true, in the midst of all the stories of violence, there have also been some stories of protesters and police marching together for justice and reform, arm in arm, in lockstep, and in loving solidarity. Such stories give us hope. But while there are certainly many good apples, we cannot ignore the number of bad apples whose very presence proves that there is something wrong with the tree. In the Gospel according to Luke, Jesus teaches, no good tree bears bad fruit. When there is no equal protection under the law, if you aren't white, then there is something wrong with the tree. And so the prophet Jeremiah tells us that like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, such systems utterly fall into ruin and become abhorrent before the world so that God's righteousness may come to be. Where is God? On the side of justice for the oppressed. The Reverend Don Morrow from the First Christian Church in Bentonville, Arkansas writes, Our society has an entire orchard full of diseased trees which need pruning, or in some cases, outright uprooting. The tree of the health insurance and healthcare industry is diseased, leaving us unable to afford and provide quality care to those who most need it. Our justice system has proven to be a diseased tree, with the appointment of judges more about politics than about fairness and equity under the law. Our electoral system is diseased, with fewer Americans trusting the effectiveness of voting because fewer Americans see effective government. Our educational system is diseased, with kids who grow up in wealthy districts treated to an entirely different experience than those who grew up in impoverished districts. And at the center of this orchard of sickly trees is the economic system, which seemingly produces big, beautiful, juicy apples at the top of the tree, at the cost of the nutrients and sunlight required to nourish the apples for the remainder of the tree. Dawn is right on. In Luke's Gospel, we read of Jesus cleansing the temple of the money changers and idolaters, proclaiming to the people that the house of prayer has been turned into a den of robbers. Jesus protested against a corrupt system that could no longer hear the cries of the people and no longer served the flourishing of life for all. Such a tree cannot stand so diseased. The question is, will we actively work to save this nation from this disease, this plague of white supremacy in all its deeply rooted forms? Or will we seek to protect the shrines of religious nationalism in the name of patriotism and at the expense of persons of color? 
let us remember the words of the prophet Amos. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. As we consider the nature of God in the midst of this time of trial, let us remember that God is one who weeps with us in moral outrage, one who sides with the oppressed and forsaken, and one whose love and justice shall remake the landscape of human systems with a flood of righteousness amidst a broken and weary land. And we are made in the image of this God. And so on this Trinity Sunday, may we reflect the image of God who loves, who liberates, and who lives in each one of us. O healing river, send down your waters upon the land and wash the blood from off the sand. My friends, be smart, be safe, and be well. My love be with you all through Christ Jesus. Amen. And now, friends, a word from the Disciples' General Office about this year's Pentecost Special Offering. To rejoice, exult, revel. To celebrate the many memorable moments of life, large and small. Perhaps with voices raised in song. Or hearts exploding with excitement. 
or family and friends drawn to a holiday table to raise a toast. But how do we celebrate a truly world-changing, life-altering milestone? Such as the welcoming of more than a thousand new churches into the family of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Since 2001, this has been the goal of the 2020 vision. And we reached and exceeded our goal ahead of schedule through the new church movement. Thanks to nurturing disciples like you and your generous support of the Pentecost offering. Each year, half of this special offering stays in your local region or area to plant and nourish new churches. The other half is used throughout the United States and Canada by New Church Ministry to train, equip, and assist church leaders at events like Leadership Academy. Imagine more than a thousand new and affiliating faith communities in just 20 years living into the teachings of Jesus Christ by welcoming the homeless, feeding the hungry, teaching the young, and transforming their communities through hands-on mission and ministry. And know that this is just the beginning. More than a thousand new churches and counting. Celebrate them and our faith with your continued support of the Pentecost offering and the new church movement. So that more disciples will be drawn to our family table. Where all are welcome. And their places are waiting. Friends, thank you for all the ways you're generous, not only with the Pentecost special offering, but your continued support of Union Avenue and all of its ministries. May God bless and multiply the gifts and the givers for the life of the world to come. Amen. Disciples, it is always a joy to gather together at the Lord's table. I'm reminded that it's not the frequency with which we gather at this table. It's the access that God has given through Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, we know that all are welcome to this table. We're also reminded of the covenant that God gives through Jesus and it's a covenant that we recommit ourselves to as we gather around the table, the covenant that you and I have as fellow believers in Jesus Christ begins at this table by remembering the covenant that God has made with us. So as we eat and drink today, let us recommit and let us remember that all are welcome. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he sat at the table with his disciples and after giving thanks, he took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink saying, this is the blood of a new covenant with God and God's creation my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of the bread and drink from the cup, we remember the Lord's death and suffering until he shall surely come again. The table of the Lord is now ready. There is room for all and there is enough for all. May we eat and drink in remembrance of the one who loved us so. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Dear friends, may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you will do what others claim cannot be done. Amen.